Good evening and welcome. My name is Keith Olsted. I chair the board for our Audubon chapter for Minneapolis. And it's my um, delight to welcome you all to our chapter's um, December program. I'm uh, so pleased that so many of you could be with us for this evening's program. Um, we'd like to uh, start these sessions by simply checking in on what people are seeing. You have uh, a couple of options for how you let us know. You can um, use the chat um, and, and let us know that you have something to report. You can go ahead and report it on your chat and we'll read it out. Uh, but uh, we'd love to hear what you're seeing. Um, the, the waterfowl um, and eagles are certainly uh, present and available um, down on the Minnesota River. Um, the swans, uh, the tundra swans are still gathered in very large numbers uh, down on southeastern Minnesota along uh, the Brownsville area. Um, Samuel cranes are still being seen both in Sherburn and in Crex Meadows and a few spots in between. But what are the rest of you seeing? Uh, in the chat section, uh, Greg is saying that long-tailed ducks are on Bidet Makaska, which is absolutely cool. Uh, brown creepers on Amy's Burr Oaks at her house. Let's see, what else do we have here? I'm gonna bounce back and forth between chat and Q&A. Um, let's try and keep them all in the chat function and that way I don't have to hop back and forth. Thank you. Uh, Irene says brown creeper, very cool. Send some to my yard. And red and crossbills, both red and white winged. Swan on Lake Harriet. Large flock of geese, I'm guessing Canada, downtown Egan. Cool. Terry says uh, that they are seeing eagles, geese, mallards, woodpeckers. So I'm guessing a variety of species down around Hastings. Excellent. And Courtney is enjoying an evening gross beak flock in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Oh, that's my home territory. Hello, Courtney. <laughs> Uh, in Ohio, Crossbills Evening Grosbeaks. Speaks. There have been a number of owls of uh, now five or six species being reported in the Sex Zim bog. Um, with our travel restrictions in place, not a lot of us are getting up there to see them, but um, they, are, they are having uh, their photos posted on several posting sites, magpies. Bird vicariously through others. Very good. Uh, in Oklahoma, starting to see bald eagles, woodpeckers, American goldfinch. Uh, lots of magpies in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and hearing some woodpeckers. Uh, Linda is saying a hawk circled by many talkative crows in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, pelicans around Brownsville, Minnesota. Yeah, we haven't had a lot of those hard freezes to push the American white pelican along. Common golden eye on the Mississippi in downtown Minneapolis. I'm curious about whether any Twin Cities folks are getting siskins at their feeders. Cool. Lake Mille Lacs, lots of eagles, pileated woodpeckers, and downy. Siskins in Roseville. Very good. I'm guessing lots of bird action. No red poles in the metro area yet, I'm guessing, but there might be some showing up. I haven't. Siskins in Apple Valley. Ah, cool. Magpies in Melbourne, Australia, uh, as well as either crows or Australian ravens. Oh, love them. Woodpeckers and titmice in Virginia. Uh, that they mean the state of Virginia, not Virginia, Minnesota. Could be. <laughs> I, I'd be stunned to have a, a titmouse in Virginia, Minnesota. Uh, Anne uh, says more parrots in the city too. Which city? East coast, south of Boston, wintering ducks, loons, grebes have arrived. Keeping eyes open for erupting songbirds and owls. 
Uh, Michelle says lots of buffalo heads by uh, Hayden Lake. Uh, let's see, I'm in St. Paul and need to put some feeders out. Yes, red poles in Southwest Montana, cedar wax wings, magpies, Cooper's hawks. Very cool. It's in Utah, Salt Lake City. Tufted titmice in Minnetonka. Uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, she says, Keith. <laughs> Blue Jays at the feeder, lots of barred owls coming into rehab right now in upstate New York. Uh, we wish you lots of luck and good success with your rehab work. Siskins in Farmington. Oh my goodness, this is like the most responses we've had about birds in a while, my goodness. Fox sparrows at the feeders, Tennessee. Melbourne, Australia, okay, is where they're seeing the parrots. So, um, uh, there's a report on rosy-breasted nuthatches. I'm guessing that's red-breasted nuthatches, but great bird to see. And also a little rosy, I would argue. <laughs> yes, they are rosy. Neighbor tur neighborhood turkeys, excellent. Very well, cool. Let's wind this down. I am so pleased that so many folks are seeing great birds. Um, and as the season uh, gets colder and the days get shorter. Um, hopefully people will still get out and and keep finding things. Yeah, there are more fun reports coming in on the chat even as we speak. So let me let me move then into um, some of the current activities for our chapter. We're in the midst of our fall fundraising campaign. We no longer have a local uh, chapter membership. Instead, we ask that anyone who wants to uh, participate in our chapter activities, join National Audubon, and that automatically makes you a member. And then we don't come back to you repeatedly during the year for, um, for money. We simply have a single fall fundraiser. So this is the time when we're asking you to think seriously about supporting our chapter's work in terms of our community engagement, in terms of our advocacy for birds and their habitat, in terms of our um, developing partnerships to care for migratory birds. Um, uh, use our website, uh, make your contributions and help us um, stay a, a healthy and thriving organization in the coming year. Um, in terms of our committee work, our migration partners um, are actually currently in the process of sending our the results of our most recent fundraising for that specific initiative down to Honduras where um, they are now excited to be able to do a whole year's worth of banding both resident and migratory birds as a result of our partnership. And we're now talking with schools about creating some partnerships between classrooms here in the Twin Cities and um, classrooms in the area of Zamorano in Honduras. So. Uh, that program is um, launched and, and taking off very successfully. Our advocacy committee is uh, continues to wait for the Minnesota Supreme Court to make its announcement about its decision on our lawsuit to require an environmental uh, scrutiny for any major development plans for our metropolitan area. Um, and we're, we're optimistic about a positive judgment in that lawsuit, but we need to wait and see what happens. Um, our advocacy, advocacy committee is working hard on developing amendments for the Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area Ordinance. That's a real mouthful, but it's a, it's a very critical um, set of guidelines that will uh, dictate what kind of development can happen in the, in the broader area of the Mississippi River in the coming years. We're particularly concerned that buildings um, be bird safe. And, and so we're working to that end. And then we're also working on the, um, on the Parks for All plan, trying to find a way to ensure that there's a balance uh, between planning activities for people and planning for birds and their habitat in our park systems. Um, these are all things that our chapter is heavily engaged in. Um, our community engagement committee is working on the birdability program, which ensures access to um, birding for uh, people of um, all levels of skill and mobility and um, aptitude. Um, we're also working hard to 
um, uh, develop relationships with organizations that have not in the past been our partners, but that we want to have part as partners in the future. So that we increase the diversity of the birding community. So um, all these things are going on and um, we'll, we'll hope that you uh, are enthused by our work and will support us with your contributions. After the program, um, Katie will, um, will introduce the um, dates and times for our upcoming meetings and um, we'll give you the contact information so that if you want to participate in any of these committees, uh, you're able to do so by contacting the chair people and signing up for the Zoom sessions. I think with that, Katie, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce Haley for this evening's program. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Keith, as you are making those changes, if we can just confirm that um, we do have this recorded. We had a few folks that weren't able to make it this evening and wanted to be able to watch it later. I'm getting the signal on my end that I am being recorded. So I think you, you're all set oh, there. Oh, very good. Thank you. <laughs> right, it still has me listed as a panelist. There we go. Excellent. All right, Keith, thank you so much. Uh, and we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see, we have someone who has raised their hand. Um, I think we will, if someone has a question, we will wait until uh, the very end or you can drop it in the chat function. Um, so tonight, we're really excited to have Dr. Kaylee Swift with us here uh, and this is a topic that there has been so much excitement around. Um, we know that crows and ravens are found on nearly every continent uh, and they're really well known and sometimes there's a lot of positive uh, feelings about them and uh, people love um, how charismatic they are and interesting and are really curious about their social structures and their behaviors and uh, how they interact with their environments and sometimes they get a little bit of a bad rap. Uh, but Dr. Kaylee Swift is perfect for helping us to dive into getting to know this really interesting group of birds and get to know them a little bit better tonight uh, and share with us undoubtedly um, some really interesting aspects of uh, how they live. And um, we'll go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Swift. I will go ahead and put myself on mute. And as I said, if there are questions along the way, please drop those into the Q&A function so I'm not having to hop back and forth between chat and Q&A, and uh, we'll make sure to get through those at the end. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, Katie and Keith. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here. It's, it was so fun for me to see everybody reporting their bird sightings and, and get a feel for just how far and wide many of you are coming from to join us here. And it also, I just always loved that moment at the beginning of Audubon uh, meetings where you just, you have all these people and they're so excited and it just thrills me as a bird person and makes me so glad to be a bird person relative to those, those sad mammal and reptile people who are just like, I don't know, I saw a white-tailed deer and a Douglas squirrel, that's the end of my list. <laughs> We're so lucky as bird people that the creatures we love are so accessible to us in such a high diversity. And there is certainly few, um, even among the birds, that compare to the accessibility of crows, which is one of the reasons that I love to talk about them so much. So with that, I want to get into my presentation. There is, as we will discover, so much to unpack in these species. Um, I'm going to cover some of the things that are most exciting to me, but I really look forward to the Q&A at the end of my talk to dive into any of the questions that we didn't cover. There are going to be many, I'm sure, uh, in the course of the presentation. 
So the very first thing I want to cover, and I know I'm speaking to my fellow bird nerds, but this can be a surprisingly tricky question. And that is, what exactly is the difference between crows and ravens? And like, is crow an umbrella term for all these birds? Or what is the deal? So just to like really surface level go over this, of course, uh, American crows, which is the dominant uh, crow species we have in North America, we have one other, which is the fish crow, and then we formerly had the Northwestern crow, but AOS actually just absorbed that into the American crow this past summer, so we only have the two. Uh, are different species than the common raven, which is the raven species that we have here in North America. In terms of distinguishing these uh, two birds, again, the, the common raven versus the more common American crow, big one is size. Uh, common ravens are about two and a half times the size of an American crow. So if you're just sort of getting into differentiating between the two, I always tell folks, you, it can be really hard if you're looking at a crow, you'll be like, is that a crow, a raven? I'm not sure. But if you're looking at a raven, even if you don't have very much experience around these birds, you have this very visceral reaction to just how large it is. <laughs> so if you find yourself going like, whoa, that is a humongous bird, that's like a raptor, then you're probably looking at a raven. Some of the other differences between these two species our ravens are generally more wildland. You're more likely to find them much further away than human settlements. Though that's not a steadfast rule, there's a really hardy re breeding population in like downtown LA and San Francisco. So these are birds that can adapt really nicely to the urban environment. But typically speaking, most of them are found further away, while crows are almost exclusively found near human settlements. Really rarely you'll ever find them more than like 25 kilometers. Uh, and then in complement to those um, habitat lifestyles, we see small differences in their diet. So ravens are more carrion specialists. They're eating a lot more animal carcasses versus crows are eating a lot more garbage and invertebrates. Those are really the two big things in their diet. And in fact, a really common behavior I bet a lot of you have seen is crows in your yard or in the fields of, of parks or you know school lots or anything like that where they're in the grass and they're just kind of walking those transects. And what they're doing in those moments is looking for um, insects all kinds and all kinds of other invertebrates. So that's actually about 40% of an urban crow's diet. Don't get me wrong though, ravens love a good dump. <laughs> and uh, any city that has ravens in the area, you will absolutely find them just gorging themselves at the city dump. So they, they take quite kindly to garbage as well. But like I said, uh, although this might be feel like a really straightforward question to a more seasoned birder, distinguishing crows and ravens, particularly in photographs where you don't necessarily have a great sense of scale, you can't hear them, you're not necessarily getting any of the behavioral uh, cues that would tip you off, can be kind of a tricky question. And I was noticing uh, back in, I think it's been four or five years now, I was just noticing a lot of misidentification of these birds and just sort of an underappreciation for just what a diverse um, genus of birds, the Corvus genus, and that's the genus that includes crows, ravens, and rooks, uh, is. So in response to that, I started a little game on social media that I play on um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter every Wednesday called Crow or No that uh, just sort of test people ability to discern these birds. And then at the end of each game, we go over a little, a few ID tips for how you could do it. So I know it's uh, after dinner for most of you, you might be feeling a little tired, just the blood's rushing to your guts, you're cozy and warm in your house. So I wanna keep everyone on their toes with a little quiz. So we're gonna play a quick round of Crow or No. I'm gonna give you four pictures. Uh, maybe we can use the hand raising function um, for, for yes or no. So I'm going to show you the picture. I'll get your vote. We'll go through them all. And then at the end, we'll go through the answers. So this one, number one, is your first bird. Uh, raise, go ahead and raise your hand if you think this is a crow. And we'll see. I'm getting, okay, I'm getting a few raised hands. Oh, yeah, there, there it goes. Lots of people raising their hands. So I, I'm not going to be able to judge if what proportion of you that is, but a fair number of people are calling this crow. Oops. 
All right, number two, let's get some raised hands if people think this is a crow. Ooh, that was a, a wall of raised hands. Okay, I think we have a, a, a bigger number of people who think this bird is a crow. Number three, oh, this is a devilish picture. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing any hands. I haven't seen one person raise their hand on this one. So we're gonna say three unanimous no crow. Oh, there's lots of hands raised. I don't know why it's not showing you. <laughs> oh, okay, lots of hands raised for this one. Keeps and going up. <laughs> finally, number four is our last bird. I wonder if it's because once you raise it once, maybe it doesn't let you do it in quick succession. But anyways, hopefully everybody had a chance to um, challenge their their birding and their their brains and their birding skills and uh, made a guess for each one of these birds. So now let's go over the answers. Okay, number one, I got a lot of hand raising for that bird and it is, oh, it's a large billed crow, it is a crow. I'm guessing a lot of you looked at that picture and went, that's a raven. And yes, that was a little mean of me <laughs> because large billed crow, it's right in the name, like ravens, they have these huge honking bills. Of course, that's what you looked at. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about this game is there is a huge diversity of these birds around the world. Um, and so once you start incorporating those other species, it's a great chance to not only stretch your identification skills a little bit, but also just to learn uh, a greater level of, bio, of avian biodiversity that exists across the world. Uh, number two, I got a lot of crows for that one. And that bird is a grackle. It's a common grackle and a good, um, so a good tell. Uh, which you're like, you're gonna think, well, why didn't you tell us that before the game? But you know, that's the rub. Is um, Corvus, so within the Corvus genus, so again, crows, ravens, and rooks, one of the uh, most distinctive features are these nasal uh, hairs. Uh, they're also called rictal bristles. So you'll always notice that crows and ravens, with the exception of, of two um, species, always have this kind of mustache on top of their bill. But other sort of monochromatic blackbirds, whether it's the icterids, like the grackles, whether it's some of the Australian species, the Australian magpie, for example, not a corvid, one of the ways you can tell is that the tops of their bills are completely bare and devoid of those special kind of hair-like feathers. The other distinctive feature of this grackle is the yellow irises. Uh, crow eyes do come in a variety of colors from brown to light blue to this kind of icy white blue to even red among the Caribbean crows, but it is incredibly rare that you ever see yellow eyes. Really the only time it happens is occasionally in juveniles within those Caribbean crow species. They'll kind of go through this yellow phase before they turn red. Our third picture right here is a common raven. That angle is tricky, right? Because <laughs> you just don't get a very good sense of size. But if you look right here, you see one of the really distinctive features of common ravens, which is their hackles. And that's the name for those specialized kind of lanceolated, heavily textured throat feathers that ravens have. In contrast to, drum roll, our very last bird, which is just an American crow. And you can see looking at the throat of this bird, it's very smooth. The feathers are much finer, almost more hair-like in appearance. And so um, that throat comparison is one of the very first things, particularly in photographs, that I um, encourage people to look at when they're first learning how to identify these birds. Or even you know later on, after you're doing pretty well, you can still just get those photos that are, the lighting's bad or the angle's off. Uh, but if you can get even a peek at those throat uh, feathers, it can be a really, really useful and more objective indication of what kind of bird you're looking at. So some of the other differences, just to uh, emphasize some of the things we've already talked about and introduce some new ones we haven't. So again, a comparison of the throat feathers. Crows have these smooth throats, ravens have these um, more heavily textured kind of 
thicker throat feathers. They can puff them out in all kinds of ways that assist them for visual communication. So when they're all puffed up big like this, that's generally a, a signal of dominance. They can also, unlike the crows, raise the feathers above their eyes in these kinds of horns. So, I, you know, I, I would never tell the crows this, but I might like ravens just a smidgen better uh, because they are so expressive because of the ways that they can articulate all of those feathers around their, their um, head and throat. And then one of the last physical features that's really helpful to look at is tail shape. Of course, this is uh, helpful when they're in flight, not so much when they're perched. Uh, but crows, generally speaking, have this rounded or more square shaped tail in flight, while ravens have that distinctive diamond shape. There are a variety of uh, tools that I have developed online to help guide you. This is one of my favorite. I collaborated with um, Rosemary Moscow, who does the bird and moon illustration. She does a variety of just delightful little comics about all kinds of animals, but she has a real bias for birds. Uh, and her and I work together to make what I call the adorable guide <laughs> to distinguishing crows from ravens. So I encourage you to look for this and keep it in your back pocket for any crow or no identification needs. So with that, let's get into some of the more interesting features of these birds' natural history. And before I start, I'm, I'm going to give away my, my ultimate goal in this talk. And that is to convince those of you who maybe came here with some reservations, maybe some kind of sour feelings about crows, uh, some reasons why I really think that these birds are among any urban naturalist sort of best uh, friend. Um, not only are these birds incredibly accessible because they live in so many places that a lot of other um, songbirds get chased out of, like heavily urban or industrial areas, but they just do a bunch of really cool things. Like if, if you were going to have one animal uh, that hung around your house when you couldn't get many other birds to come, it's really lucky that that animal happens to be crows because they just do so many cool things. And then the very last one uh, that I actually won't talk about uh, at any other point in the talk is that uh, crows can be a really great tool for identifying cool, otherwise hidden animals that uh, happen to cross your path. So for example, many a time I have used crows to identify a barred owl. Uh, in the trees above me that I never would have noticed otherwise. They've tipped me off to cool mammals like um, uh, big predators, coyotes, all kinds of things. So there's a whole variety of reasons that I hope by the end of this talk convinces you that these are really birds that rather than just kind of fading into the ubiquity of your day-to-day -day experience should really be at the forefront of your mind as a naturalist and birder. And um, to that effect, I have been known to talk for a very long time about crows. So please, Katie or Keith, uh, as we approach that six o'clock hour, feel free to uh, chime in and just give me a little wrap up signal if I'm going long. So let's start with a brief overview of kind of what makes an American crow an American crow. So first and foremost, uh, like I mentioned before, these birds are synanthropes, which just means that these are animals that haven't like kind of, you know, figured out like how to adapt to us. They haven't just um, slowly made it work or, or met that with any resistance. They are really birds that uh, purposefully exploit us. We create environments that are ideal for these animals. And there are three kind of main reasons for that. One is that uh, these are birds that don't like I said, they, you're not going to find them out in dense wooded areas, so they actually really like it when we chop down woods to install, uh, you know, urban sprawl, suburban areas. Because for nesting purposes, you know, they, they like to have a nice tall tree, but they don't need too many of them. They can actually be quite flexible when it comes to where they put their nests. So just like us, you know, they don't want a completely barren landscape, but you know, a nice couple of tall dug firs or whatever in your neighborhood, that works just great for them. The next feature is uh, crows are really one of the only animals that can exploit the industrial lawn. And in fact, uh, you know, if there's if there's one or two things that 
uh, we as Americans could do to really improve uh, our sharing of our spaces with wildlife, particularly with birds, it would be to one, keep all of our cats indoors unless they are being watched, and two, to get rid of our industrial lawns, because there's just not a lot of animals that can exploit that. But crows, because they're less um, vulnerable to predation, you know, they can kind of be out in the middle of a big grassy field without too much worry. And those grassy fields tend to be meccas for those invertebrates that they really like, things like worms. And increasingly, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, the chafer grub, which is this invasive beetle species that makes these um, enormous grubs in the ground. And I, I just went to Seattle last weekend and I could see <laughs> Lawn after lawn is absolutely demolished. The crows have absolutely demolished these lawns, ripping them up, um, seeking out these big tasty grubs. Uh, so they like our occasional tree, they like our lawns, and then the very last feature is, no surprise, they like our garbage. And we not only do we make a lot of it, but we put it outside for them so kindly and thoughtfully, uh, consistently every week. It's just a great, it's a whole, it's a great system <laughs> overall. And so these are birds that that really exploit the um, human lifestyle in a lot of ways. One of the um, important features I think uh, is that these birds live a long time. So they can live anywhere between 14 and 17 years. The oldest wild crow on record actually lived to be 29. So these are birds that, that live a very long time and there's a reason that's so important and I will circle back to that in just a minute. They are omnivores. I think we've covered that already at length. Uh, and then they are socially monogamous. So what that means is, because you might have sort of hit on like, oh, why did she say socially monogamous instead of just monogamous? So within uh, animals, right, there's all different kinds of, of mating and, and breeding systems and monogamy is a very familiar one to us as human beings. Um, but one of the things we realized is that while crows make permanent lifelong pair bonds, right, once they get with a partner, by and large, they will stay with that partner year round for the rest of their lives. When we actually do genetic studies of their offspring, we find there's like a little something going on on the side about a quarter of the time <laughs> uh, that leaves, there's a lot of work to be done there. That might vary across populations, but it's clear that these birds are not what we would call genetically monogamous. They might have a permanent pair bond, they also have a, a complex other part of their life uh, that is, is maybe less known to their partner. <laughs> uh, and together, that pair will um, establish, for the, for the most part, crows are what we call a, a partially migratory species. So most crows we have here in the United States are year-round residents. And so once a pair gets together, they will establish a territory and they will live and defend that territory year-round. Now, there are some populations of crows like in interior northern Canada that are migratory. It just gets a little too cold in the winter and so they drop um, down into the United States for, um, for the winter time. But, but most of the crows you all are interacting with are probably around year round. And that, that kind of combo of permanent pair bond, maintains a territory year round and long lived, that kind of coalesces into this amazing opportunity. Because while I love watching the chickadees and juncos and all different kinds of birds come to my feeder, right? I don't get a sort of personal sense out of that experience, generally speaking, unless those birds are banded. But with crows, when you see a pair of crows hanging out on the street light outside of your house day in and day out, you're really seeing the same pair of birds. And so once you start to watch and pay attention to them, not only is it this opportunity to learn more about crows generally, but it's this amazing opportunity to really intimately learn the lives of particular individuals. And there are many a crow watcher that can attest to just how involved and how much information you can ascertain from, from watching your local pair, be it, you know, uh, the number of kids that they produce, where they put their nests, maybe their kids come back, because that's one of the other interesting things about these birds is that they are what we call cooperative breeders. So about one-fifth, uh, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, about one-fifth 
of all Crow kids stay on uh, an additional year with their parents and they'll kind of help their parents raise the next year's brood. Um, so you'll get these kind of extended families of birds that you can potentially know pretty well. Now helpers aren't exclusively made up of kin. Sometimes they're unrelated birds. They're almost always male, just FYI. Um, but it's, it's still a really cool opportunity to kind of um, understand the family dynamics of a, of a whole nother species. And actually on the East Coast, uh, like in the Cornell, or I should say Ithaca populations of crows, we actually see um, cooperative breeding is a lot more common than it is here out West. Um, so you may find that your resident crow species has, or your resident crow pair has a much bigger extended family group um, than I make it sound here, which is just another cool opportunity to kind of appreciate how much different exists uh, across populations. If any of you are wondering why they engage in cooperative breeding, that is still across birds, but also wildlife, kind of the million dollar question. Um, it probably originated from a lack of resources. And so it wasn't advantageous for individuals for, for um, a young of a particular year to disperse because there wasn't, they weren't going to establish a territory. And so that might have encouraged this kind of staying on the natal territory, meaning the territory they were hatched on. Um, and maybe they get something out of it, additional protection, you know, just this kind of longer adolescence, uh, learning from their parents. We refer to those birds, like I said earlier, as helpers. Uh, but one of the kind of rubs <laughs> we have discovered is that they're not very helpful. And so there's this real question of like, okay, well, there's lots of reasons why it would clearly be super advantageous to that, um, you know, kid. Why do the parents put up with it? It kind of just seems like a drain on the territory's resources. And the answer is still unclear, but it may serve as a kind of insurance policy where because these birds do some level of um, food provisioning, for example, to nestlings, uh, nest building, uh, territory defense. It may be that, um, you know, a, a good healthy pair doesn't really need it, but if something were to happen in the middle of the breeding season, they're much more likely to uh, fledge that year's clutch if they have a helper than if they didn't. But that's one of those really interesting areas of um, avian uh, ecology and, and behavior that there's still so much left to discover. All right, so this, I, I can't speak for anyone in the audience, but I know when I give these talks typically here in the Pacific Northwest, this is an image that immediately resonates. Uh, and in fact, in Vancouver, BC, there's actually annual crow uh, maps that they make every um, summer to tell people uh, places to avoid if they don't wanna get dive bombed by the crows. And so, reliably in a starting about June, mid to late June, I start getting emails that are like, why did this crow, I didn't do anything wrong. I was just minding my own business. Why did this crow come after me? And that timing is really important because while it's true that crows can learn uh, individual people who have threatened them and, and they will make them regret it from <laughs> moving forward. If you don't, can't think of any reason why you'd be on a crow's bad side and something like this is happening in the summer, it is because of those cute little babies. <laughs> so um, crows, like many other songbirds, and in case that is news to anybody, crows and ravens are passerines. And in fact, the common raven is the largest passerine in the world. And like many other passerines, these birds uh, will leave the nest, they'll fledge before they're completely flighted. And that can be a surprise at first because we tend to think of nests as, as really safe places where we would think birds would want to stay as long as possible. And while it's true that more time to develop and uh, you know grow those flight feathers and all of that in the nest is good, nests are also particularly for open cup uh, nesting style birds like crows. Um, nests can be really dangerous because once a predator spies you, you're a sitting duck or a sitting crow in this case. Um, and so there's this kind of trade off between wanting to stay in the nest to, to have longer to develop and grow and wanting to leave the nest so that you don't get eaten before, <laughs> before uh, you have a chance to at least make it out. And so these birds often leave the nest before they're complete, completely flighted. 
and that can be anywhere from you know seven to even 10 days. And so there's this period of time where they're on the ground, they, they're about the size of an adult. So they may not strike you as a baby, but they are not completely flighted. And so they are incredibly vulnerable. And their parents are dedicated, of course. These are very family-oriented animals. Their parents are dedicated. They see you approaching their baby. You are a big, powerful animal. And crows have very limited resources to protect their young. But one of the really effective things they can do is dive bomb. And so that's really all that's at the heart of getting attacked by crows in the spring and, and or in the mid to late summer. It's, it's nothing you know nefarious. Uh, they're not being vindictive. They just are trying to be good and defensive parents. And so my advice if anyone um, is having this issue come next breeding season, there's a couple easy things you can do, but I think the easiest one is just carry an umbrella. And yes, people will look at you a little weird because it might be 80 degrees out and totally sunny and you have an umbrella, but that just means you have a wonderful conversation starter to things people can do to be better neighbors to our avian and other kinds of urban wildlife. And you can say, you need to write it on that umbrella. I'm carrying this, not because I'm a weirdo or I am a weirdo, but I'm also carrying this because I'm a friend to wildlife and I am trying to just tip my hat to um, my neighbors who happen to be very stressed out new parents right now. Uh, if you haven't ever seen a baby crow and you're having that sensation of like, wait, where do they come from? It's like pigeons. They just sort of appear, but no one's ever seen a baby one. The answer is probably that you have. But like I said before, these birds, um, by the time they fledge, they're about the same size of a, as adults. So a few things you can look for uh, are this pink gape. <clears throat> so this uh, chick's this chick's bill hasn't completely melanized, meaning turn black. It will quickly, but uh, even once the rest, this part of the bill turns black, the very corners are going to remain pink basically through the summer. And so that, that's a really clear indication that you're looking at a fledgling. Um, as uh, fledglings, they also have blue eyes. Those transition to brown a little earlier in the summer, but when they first pop out, they are just a brilliant, they can be a very brilliant and obvious blue. And then um, like all baby birds, their feathers aren't as good of quality as the adults. And so you'll see that they don't have that uh, same kind of glossy sheen as the, the nice, sexy um, adult molted birds do. So with kind of some general natural history out of the way, let's get into some of the behavioral things that I absolutely love about these birds. And this video is my favorite to start with because this was really my introduction into this world of animal intelligence and behavior that I did not know existed. So the bird in this video, and I'll play it in just a second, uh, is Betty. And Betty is really unique because she is a New Caledonian crow. And New Caledonia is an island off the coast of New Zealand. And one of the interesting things about New Caledonia is that there are no woodpeckers on this island which means that there is this whole food niche waiting to be exploited of grubs and other tasty insects kind of hiding in the crevices of bark uh, and trees. But the problem for a crow is even if it can, you know, detect that these uh, organisms are in there, they're not, a, they don't have the physiology of a woodpecker to just go like hammering into the bark. They'll, you know, get traumatic brain injury. So they needed to think of a different way to kind of solve this problem and get at this food niche that wasn't otherwise being exploited. And so New Caledonian crows did something incredible, which is to become really the, the uh, second non-human animal that actually makes tools. Now I want to stop right there because tool use is something that we kind of talk about. I, I think we generally get excited about tool use in animals. And there can be a little bit of a discrepancy in our understanding of, of kind of what that means. So I, I just want to make this distinction really clear. So there are a, a wide variety of animals that use tools. It's still a tiny proportion of the animals that exist on Earth. It's, it's less than 1% of all organisms use tools. But within that very, very tiny percent, the diversity of organisms that we see that behavior exist in is really wide. Anything from fish to dolphins to primates, right? It encompasses a variety of animals that are maybe not otherwise well known for their intelligence. Stepping, the, the cognitive leap though from just using a tool like a rock to hammer open a clam 
and making a tool where you're taking an object and you're actually manipulating it in a very specific and purposeful way, the cognitive leap between those two things is, is vast. And that's why there's even few, you know, only the two, like I said, it's really chimpanzees and new Caledonian crows that manufacture tools. There are a variety of other animals, uh, particularly primates that we've seen make tools in captive settings, but we haven't really been able to bear out that that's a reliable thing they do in the wild. Still though, as animal behaviorists, ethologists, you know, we always have this challenge of, you know, sometimes things animals do can look really complex on their surface, right? But they're not necessarily always guided by intelligence. So a really great example is the engineering abilities of ants. Ants are, are capable of really incredible things, but it's not because individual ants have a good sense of physics or have like little engineering degrees from like ant school. It's just because each one can execute a very tiny part of that solution in a very reliable way and put together it gives you a really complex result. So um, what's interesting or what we wanted to learn about in these new Caledonian crows is uh, we know that they manufacture tools, but the question was, do they really understand how these tools work? So in the experiment I'm about to show you, Betty has been presented a, a little cylinder and at the bottom of that cylinder is a bucket with a piece of food in it. <clears throat> and Betty and her cage mate have been given two tools. And the question was, could they choose the right tool for the job? One of them was just a straight piece of wire. And then the second one was a little hook. And again, the question is, uh, you have food in the, in the bottom of this bucket. Could these crows choose the correct tool for the job? Now, unfortunately for Betty, her cage mate picked up the hook, which is clearly the appropriate tool, and flew away. Decided, you know what, I don't feel like participating in this experiment which leaves Betty with this piece of wire. She's never worked with this material before. She's clearly hungry. And the researchers, I'm sure, are like, this bird, we just wanted to learn if these birds had an understanding of tool use and this cage mate has ruined this experiment. And what is Betty even doing? She's just wasting her time. Oh my. Wow, okay. Okay, so I guess we did learn something after all. Not only did Betty know what the right tool for the job was, but she spontaneously manufactured it. And it wasn't just any tool, it was a hook. And hooks are actually like pretty complicated tools if you think about it. So when we first saw this, just minds blown. Like this was huge news in the avian behavior, animal behavior world. Now, eventually we learned that as it happens, <laughs> New Caledonian crows actually make hooks all the time. That's one of the main tools that they make. So this wasn't quite as revolutionary, re revolutionary as we thought, but still chimpanzees don't make hooks. This is like pretty incredible. So suffice it to say, uh, these birds are incredibly intelligent and it's not just that they display really sophisticated behavior, <clears throat> but it seems like they have sort of the cognitive backing that they really understand how these things work. So just to speak a little bit, I'm checking my time here, uh, just to talk a little bit more about kind of like intelligence, because that can be a really loaded concept, right? Like who are we as humans, you know, shrouded in our human lens to judge the intelligence of others? Like how do we possibly do that objectively? And there's a great conversation to be had there about the inherent limitations but we have done our best to try and establish what we're calling the cognitive toolkit, really testable things that we've been able to demonstrate have um, cognitive precedence. And so the, the four features of that toolkit are things like causal reasoning, so understanding cause and effect. A good example is, you know, I can go out to Discovery Park uh, here in Seattle and, and I can watch the gulls pick up snails and clams and all kinds of things <clears throat> and fly them up in the air and, and drop them and break them and you know eat the goodies inside and I, I could think to myself wow that's that's really smart of that goal you know to drop it on that hard object and and bust it open to eat it like it it must understand the relationship there but when we actually do the studies we realize that goals by and large are just as likely to drop those uh, food items over things like sand and open water as they are over rocks or asphalt. Because although they've learned that flying something up high and dropping it is generally effective, they haven't really put together why. 
they don't understand that cause and, and effect relationship. The next feature that uh, we've been able to demonstrate in Corvids is imagination. So this is a little bit of an esoteric one because imagination is, is so um, is such a part of the human experience. It's kind of hard to imagine that other animals don't don't do that. Um, but it's actually a very cognitively challenging thing to envision things that are not happening right in front of you. But it is something we've been able to demonstrate, uh, particularly in common ravens. And then the last one, or the third one, is flexibility. So um, there are a lot of behaviors like squirrels, for example, caching food uh, for the next year, right? Like that seems like really good, you know, planning ahead and, and forethinking. Um, or gray lag geese, who if an egg rolls out of their nest, they're ground nesters, if an egg rolls out of their nest, they'll use their bill to push it back in. And you think, well, that's a really good idea because otherwise that, that egg would die. Uh, but what we see in those animals is there's not a whole lot of flexibility around those behaviors. They're very hardwired. In the case of the gray lag geese, for example, if you put an orange or a rock or a golf ball outside of the nest, they'll roll it right in because they're just sort of seeing a stimulus and they react. They don't really think about it. And then the last one is prospection, which is just kind of a fancy way of saying mental time travel. They reflect on past experiences and use them to, to think ahead. And these are all, again, kind of the main features of our cognitive toolkit. And it's something we've been able to demonstrate all of these within uh, Corvids, just as we've been able to demonstrate all of them within the primates. So really, um, I, I mean, I could wax on about this for hours, but suffice it to say that we should really be thinking of Corvids as basically flying primates. Uh, the cognitive abilities of these animals are, are incredible. I think I'm going to skip this video. Um, it's a great one. It goes through the kind of Aesop's uh, fable experiments where they looked at uh, some of the um, problem solving abilities of New Caledonian crows. If we have, if somebody wants to ask me after we could play it, you can also Google it. It's a fun video though of some experiments they did <clears throat> that really showed impressive causal reasoning skills among New Caledonian crows. Uh, another feature that I really like about these birds that speaks a little bit more to ideas of theory of mind, of, of things like empathy and consciousness, is the work that has been done on ravens in terms of, of their ability to like really understand one another and actually um, exhibit something called emotion contagion, which is really the foundation of empathy. Uh, and, and two of my favorite studies that have illustrated this, one looked at kind of their political scheming. Um, so ravens exist in these very hierarchical societies where just like with people, people in positions of power and ravens in positions of power don't really wanna give those positions up. Might sound familiar to us right now. Uh, and so part of the ways that ravens maintain their power is they are very sensitive to the, um, uh, to alliance formation between other birds in their social group. And so they'll kind of like keep tabs on everybody's social status. And if they see two birds that, you know, could be a formidable opponent, if those two birds were to, to link up and kind of form a partnership, ravens will actually go and they'll physically disrupt those two birds from interacting, uh, which is just an amazing level of kind of, of understanding <clears throat> and forethought into their social dynamics. And then as far as empathy goes, we've seen experiments, again, that show um, something called emotion contagion. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, basically what the experience of empathy is, is like, I'm going on, and I'm having a really good day. And then I call my friend on the phone and she had a really crappy day. And so now I'm like feeling bad, right? Like I sort of took on her emotional state, even though I didn't directly experience that. And we've been able to see that ravens do something really similar. So I love this experiment. It was so well thought out, um, where basically um, they had two groups. And in each group, you had an, a, a demonstrator and an observer. And the demonstrator was given a box. And in half the groups, group A, uh, what was in that box was like really cool. It's a really great treat. And in the other half, what was in the box was something crappy. But the observer, they couldn't see what the demonstrator saw in the box. The observer just saw the demonstrator react to what was in the box. And then what they did is they gave the observer their own box. 
And what they found is that observers who had watched another raven get really psyched about their box, oh, they were then they were really excited to look in their box too. But if they saw a raven kind of like not be so jazzed, then, then they didn't really want to look in the box, <laughs> which is not only like just cute to think about, but is a great kind of hint um, that, that these birds probably possess a level of empathy uh, that we haven't really uh, given animals credit for in the past. Perfect. And so um, to kind of bring things home, I want to talk quickly about the work that I did as a graduate student at the UW. So my main um, area of research was actually in the funeral behaviors of American crows. And what I mean by that is uh, when a crow dies, <clears throat> we typically see that uh, when, once it's discovered by another crow, that bird will alarm call, very similar sound to what you hear if you see them going after eagles or your cat or whatever it is. And that alarm calling attracts other birds to the area. Now, the observation of that phenomenon was not new to us. I did not sort of bring that into the forefront of science. And in fact, human beings have recognized that as a behavior for thousands of years all over the world. In fact, you can see references to it in um, things like the Quran uh, and other religious texts around the world. <clears throat> so that was well known to human beings. What we knew less though was, was why. And of course, there are a whole variety of ways we could explain this. Um, some of them are really interesting, but not very testable, like that they're sad, they're grieving. Uh, but other ways, like that they might use these experiences to assess danger, are more testable. And so that's what I really focused my graduate work on. We see funeral behaviors in a variety of other animals. We won't go into these too much but actually insects are the group that we know the best. Many social insects have really rigorous, what we call undertaking behaviors that they use to remove dead animals. Um, but um, cetaceans like dolphins, primates and elephants are, are of course also really well known for their attention towards their dead. And one of the, the ways that we can kind of visualize this is there's a small group of animals, again, mostly insects, but some others, where we've done a lot of experiments to really understand what they're doing. And then in these other groups, we mostly just have stories from scientists, from naturalists, from other kinds of observers. And those stories aren't necessarily super consistent. One person might see an elephant stand by the body of its dead mother for weeks, and another sees the herd just walk by really quickly. Uh, among primates, you might see gentle grooming over the course of hours, or you might see them uh, beating and biting and ripping up the body. And so there, there's a whole lot of sort of complexity there that's made it hard for us to parse what might really be driving these behaviors. But corvids are interesting because they're kind of, they fall right in the middle between these groups. So the key questions for me as a graduate student is I wanted to really quantify how they responded. I wanted to test the adaptive value <clears throat> of their attention towards their dead, specifically as it relates to the possibility that it indicates danger. I wanted to know if they were paying attention to context, things like how old the bird was at the time it died or, or the season in which they uh, encountered it. And then I looked at their brains to try and understand what part of their brain was actually mediating this activity. So for how and why they respond, I'll just summarize it to say that um, we looked at, again, danger learning, specifically whether they could learn new predators based on their proximity to dead crows. So for example, if they saw a person holding a dead crow, do they learn that person's face? And then the second context was, do they learn to associate the place where they saw that dead body with danger? And we found that the answer to both of those questions was yes. And you can read all about that uh, in this paper, which you can access on my blog. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions after the talk. With respect to what kinds of things are they paying attention to? I asked, you know, do they pay attention to the age at time of death, <coughs> uh, adults versus juveniles, and we might uh, hypothesize that they would, particularly since we have evidence that this is cues of danger. Uh, it makes sense that an adult, which is much harder to kill, adult survivorship in crows is about 80%, uh, would be a much stronger indication of danger than a juvenile, which, you know, 
50% of, of crows will die their first year. So seeing a dead one of those, while you know, this may be a bummer, is not necessarily a good indication that something really dangerous is around because these birds are naive and much more vulnerable. And indeed, we found that crows are more attentive to adults. So that's kind of another check in our column of seems like this is related to danger learning. But in addition, we also learned something that we were not expecting to see in these birds. So um, unlike that first study where I had somebody kind of holding a dead crow, crows couldn't necessarily come <clears throat> excuse me, very close to the dead body. In these latter experiments where we were looking at age, I would just put the specimen uh, right on the sidewalk, close to the um, nesting tree, not too close, about 50 meters uh, from the nesting tree of a territorial pair. <clears throat> and what we found was while yes, they still alarm called and gathered, particularly in the early spring, they also did a little something else. <sighs> to unpack there, but suffice it to say, you're basically seeing, you know, that alarm behavior like I talked about, <clears throat> but two others that I haven't talked about yet. One was sexual behavior. So we saw um, both the male and female from the territorial pair coming in and uh, mounting uh, our dead crow slash one another, a little unclear there. And you saw aggressive behaviors. So this was another really interesting study that is also out that you can read in full but basically we quantified how often tactile interactions of any kind occurred. It's only about 40% of the time, it's constrained to the breeding season. <clears throat> and we found that sexual and aggressive behaviors, <coughs> excuse me, I must mean that it's the end of my talk, <laughs> uh, are really limited to the very earliest part of the breeding season. So there's probably some interesting things to unpack there in terms of how hormonal changes that they undergo as a result of the breeding season influence their behavioral interactions. And then the very last thing we looked at is um, their brain response. So the reason we were interested in this is you know, when we see a crow respond in the wild to a dead crow, we're, we're fairly limited in terms of the range of behaviors that it, they express, right? They alarm call, they might dive bomb, they might engage in those tactile behaviors, but that's kind of it. But we know based on previous studies that the way that they are mentally responding to say, <clears throat> different kinds of predators, whether it's a red-tailed hawk or a familiar person, actually uh, there's a lot of different things happening in their brain. And so as a way to kind of, um, what's that roundabout, try and ask this question of like, are they maybe feeling any kind of like emotional dimension and sadness? We wanted to see if um, the part of their brain we would expect to be most active have that uh, should that be the case, the amygdala, we wanted to look for activation there. So I can go into the details if anyone wants to know during the Q&A section, uh, but suffice it to say this is <clears throat> a non-lethal brain study, which is pretty rare. Actually, in the neurological world, it's pretty awesome that not only was this non-lethal, but all of the crows in this study uh, were released back to the wild at the, its conclusion. And what we learned from this um, experiment was basically that Nope, we do not see any activation in their amygdala. Instead, we see the part of their brain that's responsible for that complex decision making actually lighting up uh, when they see a dead crow, which is the same part of their brain that lights up when they see a red-tailed hawk. So again, that sort of uh, underlined this idea that dead crows are really strong indications of danger. But of course, in all of these experience, experiments, one important caveat is that we showed them unfamiliar crows. And we really don't know what might be different if they were to see a bird that was familiar to them dead. It, it might dramatically change things or it might have no effect. I can't really say. 
And then the very last thing I want to end on, just because I think this is a great kind of way to put a bow on it, is this kind of really unique connection that we have to crows and that crows have to us. And I, I love this picture. I took this on the UW campus a few years ago because it just really nicely illustrates how uh, whether we like it or not, and in this case, we don't like it, you can, you can barely make out the bird spikes that have adorned this statue fruitlessly. Uh, whether we like it or not, these birds really build their worlds on our backs. And so um, we're, we're better off giving in <laughs> and finding ways to connect and, and really appreciate these birds. And uh, we can be richly rewarded for doing that. As I mentioned earlier, these birds uh, can learn our faces. They do so pretty quickly and they do not forget them. So if you form some kind of bond with this bird, hopefully not a negative one, hopefully it's based on positive interactions, uh, you can expect a bird <clears throat> to be looking for you and remembering you for many, many years to come. And in rare cases, those relationships can even come with presents. Uh, there are a whole variety of folks that have reported getting gifts. Now, whether or not those are truly gestures of gratitude, I'm a little dubious of, but you know what? I, I don't have any evidence to argue against it. We don't know yet. So for now, I think if you feed a crow and it leaves you a little candy heart uh, or the keys you know, to a Mercedes parked out front of your house, go ahead and think that's a gift. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I think we're all better off for believing um, and, and finding joy in the interactions that we have um, with the animals that we share our world with. So with that, uh, I am more than happy to take questions. I don't know, Katie, do you wanna sort of feed me questions or do you want me to go through the, the Q&A and the chat myself? Oh, um, up to you. I'm happy to, to kind of work through them. I know um, we, we have some that are in the chat and some comments that were kind of populating as you were giving the program. Um, so I will leave it up to you. What would you prefer? Why don't, if you can sort of maybe curate anything that um, came until just now, um, sure. just so I make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, but oh I, gosh, yeah. yeah. So um, we're gonna go ahead and and jump into uh, some of the comments and questions. Um, we are thrilled to have so many people that were able to join us for this program, and I don't know that we'll get to every single question. So if I don't this evening, I apologize, uh, and we will make sure to. Um, share and we have uh, Dr. Swift's contact information up here so you can reach out directly to if we don't happen to get to your question. Um, one moment while I get to my place here just beyond our bird species check-in. Okay. Lots of bird reports. <laughs> I think uh, I'll start with the first question that I, I find, um, Katie, and then you can see if, if I um, skipped any. But the first one I see is, do, do ravens also have thicker feathers around their legs? No, um, they can both, so they can articulate them, kind of puff them out. We call that the pants down <laughs> look, but both uh, crows and ravens can do that actually. Okay. Okay. So I see where we are. Um, huge flock of crows, boop, 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 some comments. Uh, in India, we believe that crow coming to your terrace is a good omen and a message that your loved one is going to unite with you after long separation. So there are folk songs in praise of crows and inviting them uh, with lots of goodies. Yeah. And that that's a really great... <clears throat> Point to raise because it's a reminder that you know many people think of crows as being omens of, of death or, or foreboding uh, and while that's true it's also a very eurocentric uh, belief if we look in other parts of the world we see crows associated with things like luck and prophecy ancestral ties um, uh, creation you know all, all kinds of things and so while crows do in in some parts of history and in some parts of the world <clears throat> have these more negative associations. To other people in other parts of the world, uh, their reputations are, are much, much better. <laughs> so I always love a, a reminder to um, 
uh, just how widely these birds have sort of infiltrated the cultures of people all around the world and how um, those people look at them are, are really geographically and culturally specific. So we have another uh, comment. Uh, someone had pointed out that they noticed that they don't allow any other nests on the same tree. There was a huge eucalyptus tree. Only one pair of crows will nest and they've been watching uh, these birds for almost 10 years now. Yeah, so the nesting constraints are, are seem to be very geographically different and kind of population specific. Some crows live on these really big territories and they don't wanna see any crows anywhere around them. Um, other birds will be packed in pretty closely, but aside from rooks, no crows are, co are colony nesters. So rooks will actually are more like herons where you'll have a bunch of nests all in the same tree, but um, there's not really any other species of crows that uh, will allow another couple to be in their nest tree. That's correct. Next question, are New Caledonians, in quotes, smarter than American crows? Uh, this guest is curious if their hook knowledge is innate or learned. So it's both. Um, they will definitely pick up new tricks from watching one another. Uh, but it is innate, so they do they do hatch knowing how to make their tools <clears throat> to some level. But are they smarter? That's a really tricky question. Um, you know, animals uh, evolution isn't a linear race to some goal other than survival, right? <clears throat> so New Caledonian crows can do this really sophisticated tool making thing, but that's because it benefited. Uh, and was shaped by their natural history in a way that American crows haven't had that sort of selection pressure to do that because they live with woodpeckers and they don't really need to exploit the world in that particular way. Um, American crows have things that they are slightly better at or kind of more skilled at than New Caledonian crows. And so while I, uh, a big advocate that crows as a group, crows and ravens as a group are incredibly smart, I don't tend to then try and compare species against one another just because there's so much nuance there. It's really hard to do that. Uh, next question. Do crows tend to gather in flocks while ravens are more solitary or limited to pairs? Yes and no. <clears throat> so ravens or so crows as adults, particularly in the wintertime, will even for territory holders will form these kind of social groups and territory boundaries tend to relax a lot and even actually in some parts of the country their territory boundaries are always super relaxed ravens on the other hand an adult breeding pair are vicious territory defenders um, they'll they will sometimes go to the roost and definitely unmated ravens roost socially just like crows do so again that's one of those like yes kind, kind of generally crows tend to flock a little more than ravens but there's like kind of so much going on there that i i hate to just offer that as a blanket generalization because it kind of washes away a lot of the the nuance about their behavior there Thank you. Uh, the next, and you may have kind of worked through some of this in the program, but I just want to make sure that we that we address the question, um, is how do you assess or identify um, in the behavior that a crow or a raven is mourning? So we don't. Yeah, that's a, a really tricky question. Without being able to ask a crow kind of how it's feeling, <clears throat> I don't know that I will ever, with my scientist hat on, be able to confidently say that, that crows mourn. Certainly when they lose a mate, they do seem to exhibit a kind of a behavioral change. Um, but part of the part of sort of my role as an ethologist is to not only ask like what I think a behavior is, but why it exists. And one of the things that keeps me from um, kind of jumping, you know, completely headfirst into this idea that they have this sort of really long lasting, deep emotional reaction to death is that it wouldn't be very advantageous for them to do so. If a crow loses its mate, for example, uh, if it doesn't secure another mate pretty quickly, it's probably not gonna reproduce the next year. Uh, and these birds are, are absolutely driven to, you know, be successful breeding wise every year. Uh, and likewise, when we see them lose offspring, 
there tends to be very, very little sort of behavioral change that we see after that. But again, it's so hard because maybe the kind of emotional reactions of these animals manifest in ways that are not easily recognizable to us as people. So where I fall on the spectrum of like, are crows mourning is, I don't know. And I'm really comfortable not knowing the answer to that question, partly because I make sure that I don't create a value system for wildlife that's contingent on how relatable I find them or where they kind of fall on the spectrum of emotional intelligence. And I think that kind of being open and appreciating wildlife, regardless of that, uh, is really the, the best strategy we can use as humans to make sure that we are caring for and treating all wildlife with respect while still keeping open the possibility for incredible similarities or incredible differences with ourselves. Excellent. Uh, next question, are there studies and interactions like this with ravens? Um, so I'm assuming uh, focusing on your work, on your research. Ooh, good question. No, just gonna <laughs> say no. Uh, we know that they respond, but there's very little research, so. Just say okay. no in this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next um, reads UV color patterns with a question mark. So I'm not. Okay. okay. I'm so glad you asked. I literally spent like four hours today <laughs> researching this. <laughs> I'm wondering, I would love to see you put in the chat if you're asking this because of Carl Bergstrom's uh, viral picture of the blue crows. Okay. Here is the short version of the story. Passerines have generally speaking, excellent UV color detection. Corvids don't. They got left out. I don't know what the deal is, but they are much more like the flycatchers and raptors, which are, um, so you can group basically, okay. So birds have four cones. Uh, we have three. Their fourth one gives them a greater visual perception of those really short ultraviolet wavelengths. But within that cone, you can subdivide it into two categories. One is the like heavy UV seeing birds and the other one is the more like they can see it a tiny bit, but not much and crows belong in that other group. So they, they definitely detect it, but not a lot. And we've done studies to see if there is information, for example, coded about sex in their feathers, because we know that uh, European starlings, for example, which are incredibly iridescent, advertise their sex to potential partners through the UV patterning in their feathers. Crows do not. So yeah, it is um, really surprising given that that's so consistent across all of the passerines, but that does not seem to be a big feature of crows uh, sensory experience of their world. Very fascinating. Uh, another question was, did you become attached to any particular crows during your graduate studies? Did you develop a, affinities for any of the individuals? We did. You can see it right here. Go. <laughs> my favorite crow. <laughs> she was a banded crow on UW's campus. Uh, she was one of my very first data points and uh, her territory overlapped with my office. So after that first experiment that I described to you ended um, and that exper experiment involved feeding the crows every day. Uh, she kept coming by and expecting her food. And so I acquiesced and started carrying peanuts in my pocket every day. And uh, yeah, I, I probably fed and interacted with her every day for about three years. Uh, and unfortunately, she passed away. Uh, she was 16 at the time, so a very long lived bird. But um, yes, this was a, a very special bird to me. And if you want to know more, you can check out my Ologies uh, podcast episode where I, I give a little bit more of the background of her story. Uh, and then I also did a blog post dedicated to her when she died. So I encourage anyone to check that out. Thank you. Uh, another uh, comment is, we have always been taught to not look at the eyes of a crow for too long or they will attack you. Is this of any relevance? No. So the only reason that's relevant is if you're trying to befriend crows, I would give you that advice. Don't look at the, them in the eye too long. Um, crows are not sensitive to facial expression the way that dogs are, but they are very sensitive to the direction of gaze and they're, they get very nervous if you stare at them too long. So, so in stark contrast to getting attacked, actually what staring at a crow does is make it move away from you. Um, so if you're trying to befriend, befriend crows, you know, after you throw those peanuts, try and avert your eyes. It will make them much more comfortable. 
Excellent. Uh, so we'll do a couple more questions and then I um, do want to be respectful of your time as well because we really appreciate you uh, giving so much of it this evening. Um, do crows use a sense of smell for finding food or other interactions? Not especially. So birds relative to uh, most other animals have a pretty underdeveloped sense of smell. They have a better sense of smell than we thought. <coughs> their olfactory bulbs are, bulbs are really small, but they're, they actually work better than we realized. And some birds like shearwaters, albatross, uh, actually really heavily rely on their sense of smell to detect prey. But um, that doesn't seem to be the case with corvids. They're much more visually based animals. Right. Uh, there is a question uh, around nesting. Uh, is it right that crows put their eggs in a uh, cuckoo's nest so the cuckoo will raise them as her own? Uh, it's apparently is a folk tale in India. So there's some questions around um, just sort of the, the history of that, that story. Not to my knowledge. No, I, I don't know of any species. And in India, we'd be talking primarily about the house crow. Um, I don't know of any crow species, including the house crow, to be a nest parasite. Egg dumping happens occasionally, where birds will just like dump their eggs randomly, uh, even though it's not a normal part of their reproductive strategy. Um, but uh, so no, cuckoos on the other hand, that the reverse is true. So cuckoos are typically nest parasites <coughs> where they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And since you brought this up, I'll tell you this because it's so cool. Okay, so here, so birders, right? You probably, most of you are familiar with nest parasites like cowbirds and cuckoos. And the whole premise there is the parasite lays its egg and the host bird is like, oh, this egg, I don't know. It looks like my egg, it's my baby now. I'm just gonna raise it, right? Because if they could tell that it wasn't their egg, they should kick it out, so, right? So they're not donating all of these resources to this kid that's not theirs. Here's the thing though, common magpies, so the, what is it called? Ooh, I'm blanking on the type of cuckoo. Um, anyways, there's a particular type of cuckoo that uh, commonly uh, um, parasitizes the common magpie over in Europe. <clears throat> and magpies actually do seem to be able to recognize that they're not their eggs, and yet they raise them. Why would they do this? Because cuckoos wait and watch and see if the the magpie kicks their eggs out and if they do they'll come back and they'll destroy the magpie's entire nest so it's like this amazing example of animal extortion <laughs> where the cuckoos are like you raised my baby or you're none of your babies are gonna live and i just like <laughs> oh my gosh when i learned that i was like i love birds so much <laughs> <laughs> excellent um so we'll do two more just to kind of wrap up here with the the q a session um, it just these really jumped out at me and I, I want to, to call them out here while we have you uh, on the line. So the first is inquiring about um, a lot of the videos that have been circulating the internet for years uh, where um, these birds are seen doing things like the sledding and some of the, the play. Um, so chalked up to having fun. And is it something that is scientifically recognized is what they're they're saying. Yes, it is scientifically recognized that corvids play. Why they play is more controversial. Um, it's probably just for fun. It's probably because these birds, because they live in, in protected social groups, have the bandwidth to play that like your Wilson's warbler just doesn't because they're like stressed out all the time <laughs> just trying to survive. <laughs> Um, but yes, they do play. There's seven kinds of play, including object play, vocal play, bath play, um, and, and sledding is a big one. So sledding on snow, sledding on other slippery surfaces. Uh, yep, recognized real thing. Cool. Uh, and the final, and maybe you can just tell us what some of your favorites are. Uh, there was a question around some good books to learn a little bit more about these amazing birds. Yeah, so if you go, and I, I saw this question too, if you want to um, stay in contact with me, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, <coughs> and Twitter, all at the Corvid Research handle. I also have a blog that I update 
irregularly, but you will soon see a whole article about UV because <laughs> that's what I spent today working on at my blog. And one of my articles is actually my, my book recommendations. So I have a whole list there depending on what specifically you're interested in. But my kind of go-to recommendation is in the Company of Crows and Ravens by John Marsliff because it's, it's the best general overview, really accessible, really fun read. Um, if you're if you're just getting into these birds. So that that is my main thing. But um, I also encourage you to check out my blog for um, just a whole suite of other articles about really common behaviors. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for just an incredible and engaging presentation. This was fascinating. And I feel like uh, you could have talked for hours and everyone would have just absolutely devoured it. You clearly have an incredible passion uh, for the work that you do and for this amazing group of birds. I do indeed, Katie, and I, I so thank you. And I just want to encourage everybody who came because I noticed a lot of you were um, from all over the place that if you enjoyed this program, I definitely encourage you to thank Minneapolis Audubon by participating in their fall pledge drive. Um, they were gracious enough to compensate me for being here and contributions from you folks are what allows them to bring in and make accessible other great speakers such as myself. So I, I encourage you to, to thank them if you have the resources to do so. Thank you. Uh, and I will just in uh, final notes to, to everyone on the call that uh, if you're interested in keeping up with our Audubon chapters virtual programs, uh, our in-person um, when we kind of get to that point, uh, when we can reconvene uh, any of the activities and, and things that we have going on, definitely um, check us out on our website. We keep that up to date. We have blog posts. Uh, we post our program videos on our YouTube channel and are relatively active um, on Facebook and just getting into Instagram as well. So uh, we've got lots of opportunities to stay engaged uh, at the beginning of the program, if any of you missed it, the chair of our board uh, did share that we have a number of different uh, volunteer supported committees that work on a range of different aspects of our work that benefit birds, the environment, and birders, of course. Uh, and to learn when those meetings are happening, what they are up to, and how to jump on a Zoom call just to even check it out. Uh, all of that information is posted on our website. So uh, the Audubon chapter at Minneapolis, you don't have to be in Minneapolis or even in Minnesota to get involved. So feel free to check it out. Thank you so much. And everyone have a wonderful night. Hope to see you next time. <laughs>